Okay, cool. So, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. For those of you I don't know, my name is Rachel. I'm a grad student as well as an um, intro to creative writing instructor here at NYU. Um, and along with a few other friends, uh, began this sort of initiative called Manderly Collective, which began um, really, you know, to sort of extend this endeavor of writing, which can so often be individual into a sort of larger community space. And we were especially feeling the need for that at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when we were feeling isolated for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so it's sort of grown our, our project into this larger reading series and sort of event series, which we're really excited about. Um, and we've had, you know, like more international artists, we've had more local artists. And obviously this event is pretty local to NYU, but it's absolutely one of my favorites of the semester. We did it uh, last semester and we, we had sort of part one of this event last night. Um, so I'm so, so excited for this part two of two of our, of our student showcase. Um, so yeah, on behalf of the collective, on behalf of everyone participating tonight, I wanna to welcome all of you and thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, our, our goals are really to, we have a few, I suppose. Uh, one is to just, um, uh, you know, uh, allow for students at the undergrad and graduate level to read and hear what one another are writing across degree programs, across classes. Um, you know, it's so exciting to hear everyone's work and what everyone's working on now. And, and we just wanted to create a space where we could do that and engage with that together. Um, and also just as instructors, it's so wonderful to be able to hear and highlight and celebrate the work that all of our incredible students are doing. So um, that being said, we're so excited to have this sort of part two of two um, and so excited to hear what all of you are going to read tonight. So for those of you who are reading. Um, so yeah, all of that being said, I'll turn it over to Alex, who will uh, present our first group of readers. Hey, I, I was thinking I would read first and then I'll have my two students follow. Um, I'm Alex. I'm an instructor of one of the intro classes and I'm a grad student in fiction. And I'm going to read about three pages about an obstetrician in Alaska in the year 2050 who closes down his private practice to start an international scientific consulting firm. Dr. Victor Bickle remembered the face of every baby he ever delivered. This was easy since as far as he could tell, they all looked exactly the same. Pudge nose, sludge body, all flush and porcine. Day after day for 30 years, he ushered new babies into the world and the lot of them crawling in formation with shrunken expressionless faces haunted his dreams. He often woke up in a sweat asking himself, does humanity have no purpose beyond the production of smaller humans? Both in stature and merit, Dr. Bickle saw people getting smaller with each generation. These tiny babies whose invasion he abetted by profession were a sorry replacement for his own heroes of yesteryear, who stood 10 feet tall in the form of holographic projections around the waiting room of his OBGYN office. Real thinkers like Leonardo, Cavendish, and Einstein, who lived before the technologized world of Bickle's time with its driverless cars, flash formed foods, everyone plugged into their hollow screens, hurrying around on supersonic planes, not to be misunderstood, Bickle wasn't one of those small town docs who yearned for the good old days, quite the contrary. If he admired the thinkers of yesteryear, it was because he credited them with producing the modern world. Babies, on the other hand, those primitive creatures couldn't even walk, let alone keep up with the pace of life in 2050. As Bickle saw it, babies had no function in the world of the future and working for them was dragging him down. It was this not at all convoluted line of thought that led the obstinate, nostalgic, ambitious obstetrician to close down his private practice. Victor Bickle, MD, PC. The practice was named not for him, but for his father, from whom he'd inherited it. Victor Bickle, Sr., also an obstetrician, had served Heber Creek, Alaska with a selfless smile and attentive hands for 50 years. For 50 years, he'd welcomed newborn Heber Creekers into the world. And for that, he was remembered as a father to the entire town. Not to his son though, Bickle hated Bickle Sr.'s guts for shoehorning him into the medical, through medical school and into the family business. He found their years of sharing an office space practically insufferable, and he was happy the old man was dead. And now that his father was dead, interred within the hard Alaskan permafrost for just, just weeks ago, Bickle was free from the expectation that he keep running the OBGYN practice. The world around him was rapidly changing. Well, he wanted to change too. 
At the age of 58, while his peers were planning for retirement, Victor Bickle decided it was time for a career change. He was sick of catering to babies. The one thing he did learn though from his years in the rotating company of the literally least accomplished little people on the planet was the glamor of potential. Babies rested their laurels on that and that alone and everyone loved them. Well, Bickle felt he had much broader potential as a visionary of science than the practice of obstetrics indulged. He was quite a broad thinker and to prove it, he fired everyone who thought otherwise. That is, everyone but his nurse Tanner, who had his shortcomings, but overall seemed more with it than the sum of Bickle's other nurses and technicians carried over from his father's practice. Tanner was a local boy who had worked with Bickle for four years. Three months after closing down, his office space reopened as Bickle and Son Neighborhood Scientific Consulting Group, LLC. Bickle thought it would be strategic to preserve the old OBGYN practices, small town, family oriented image, ergo Bickle and Son neighborhood, so on. But this was not because his new firm would be small town or family oriented, not at all. Rather, he thought that the small town family oriented image would appeal to clients in the big cities of the world, where rural values were still romanticized, where people didn't realize how depressing a place like Heber Creek was. Bickle hated Heber Creek with its petty gossip, its sad Christianity, its dirt roads. Over his years of delivering babies, he'd made a lot of mistakes. Absolutely he had, there was no denying that. But he figured that none were as big as the mix up that must have occurred when he himself was born in this unlikely boondock. Though based in Heber Creek, Bickle and Son Neighborhood Scientific Consulting Group was from its inception an international firm. He lined one wall of his office with clocks set to every major time zone. He moved his decorative holograms of Leonardo, Cavendish, and Einstein to the dusty sidewalk outside his offices, so passersby would, so passers would understand the seriousness of the work being done in this establishment. He replaced the large tank of goldfish in his waiting room with a wall of glass drawers containing reptiles and rodents, and refitted his operating rooms to function as hazmat laboratories, in thrilling violation of numerous terms of his lease. His new business was available for hire to do any sort of science, any at all except obstetrics. He swore to never deliver another baby again. Couples still occasionally showed up for an obstetrician, but Bickle told them that he was now only interested in babies if they had died within the last 36 hours. After that, he said, the degradation of vital organs precluded consequential dissection. This was excessive, but got the message across. Be excessive, not elessive, he always told Tanner. The fact that Tanner was not actually his son, merely his assistant, would not spare him from Bickle's life lessons. Tanner was tasked with pitching Bickle and Son Neighborhood Scientific Consulting Group to potential clients around the world. He had never been around the world. In fact, Bickle was pretty sure he'd never been outside of Heber Creek, Alaska, but what he lacked in global corporate wherewithal, he more than made up for in small town charisma. He had a trustworthy demeanor, a sort of innocent eagerness to please, that would leave every potential client assured that he was their guy and no one else's. While Tanner shuttled around the globe to meetings with governments and trade executives, Bickle developed their vast practice areas and even threw together a brand new website. Bickle and Son get it done. When you're in a pickle, just pay Bickle. Servicing needs in medicine, physics, engineering, and applied psychology with specializations in counterfactuals, hypotheticals, and schemes, boasting a combined 36 years experience no longer practicing obstetrics. Um, that's all I'm gonna read. Next up is one of my students, Nula Sanchez. Nula's a sophomore in Tisch studying theater. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, that's kind of hard to follow, but I'll try. Um, so I'll be reading um, a story I wrote for class, just an excerpt about three pages called The Fog. I'm in our kitchen standing in front of the fridge. I can't quite remember waking up this morning or climbing out of bed or walking to the kitchen. Nevertheless, I'm here. My hair is in tangles and I'm, I'm in my no one is going to see me outfit, which consists of one of my dad's old t-shirts with the word sarcastic comment loading printed on it and pink sweatpants with the name of my sister's high school dance team down the leg. I've been staring blankly at the contents of our fridge for far too long now. My eyes drift out of focus and the food in the fridge becomes vague colored smudges next to one another. I hear my roommate, Jen's soft footsteps coming into the kitchen as she scuffles her way down the hall in her fluffy slippers, humming rather loudly to herself. 
the amount of happiness Jen exudes so early in the morning is remarkable and incredibly obnoxious. Looking for something, she asks. We're out of milk, I say. Well, she says, maybe use the almond milk. Almond milk tastes like sewage water, I say. I close the fridge door and walk to the front entrance of our apartment to scour through the closet for my jacket. It's February in New York, and I've been wearing the same men's utility jacket I found at a thrift store for a few months now, which, Jen says, makes me look like a combination of Oliver Twist and an old man. Where are you going, Jen asks. Picking up some milk, I reply. Are you not coming today, she asks. Where, I say. Jackson and I are taking the train upstate, Jen says. We're going apple picking, remember? Oh, right, I say. You should come, she says. Jen and Jackson have been dating for over a year now. I don't mind Jackson. He's nice. He wears button-down shirts and likes to talk about artisanal coffee brands, which I can't personally relate to, but Jen sometimes appears interested. He always seems to be entirely confused by my existence, and at times I can understand why. He spends many nights in Jen's room, and oftentimes he'll get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and find me sitting at the kitchen table reading the same Nicholas Sparks novel while shoveling Cheerios into my mouth. It never bothers me when he sees me like this, but... I can always tell by his loud sigh and furrowed brow that he was not necessarily delighted by my presence. He makes Jen happy though, and I like to see Jen happy. I think I'll pass, I reply. You're not gonna be a third wheel, I promise, she says. I've got a few things to catch up on today, I say. Audrey, Jen says, you really should get out of the city, get some fresh air. I'm really fine, I say. I don't wanna sound rude, she says, but lately you've been a little, you know. What, I say. Jen mouths the word depressed, as if saying it any louder would awaken some horrible depressed monster inside of me. Jen and I were not a duo most people expected, including me. I remember the first time I saw Jen at a Halloween party our first year of college. I was sitting on a couch drinking a vodka Sprite with a near intolerable vodka to Sprite ratio, listening, or rather trying not to listen to, a guy dressed as the Wolf of Wall Street explained to me why we can't just print more money. She was gliding through the party, waving at several people, complimenting everyone she walked past and glowing in every way. She was angelic and I was in complete and utter awe. I excused myself and went to pour myself another drink. As I stood there trying to figure out which tall bottle of liquor was vodka, I heard her behind me say it tastes better with a splash of cranberry juice. I told her I liked the costume. She was Britney Spears from the Oops, I Did It Again video and we got to talking. Well, mostly Jen got to talking. Jen likes to talk a lot, which I don't mind because I like to listen. Jen told me all about her family, how her parents were recently divorced and that it's okay because at least she gets two Christmases now. She then went on about how much she loves New York, getting to listen to jazz music in the park, eating bacon, egg and cheese bagels exclusively at one very special shop. And even when there's a surprise mariachi band on the subway. She seems whimsical and free. Right now, I don't see that familiar whimsical look on Jen's face. I see her, please just let me mother you look, staring me down. I'm not depressed, I reply. I don't mean that in a bad way, she says. I just worry about you sometimes. Don't worry, I say, as if these two words will be entirely convincing and put the whole issue to bed. She is still giving me the look, and I know if I stay any longer, she just might crack me. Awesome. Um, next is my student, Raphael, Raphael Williams. Raphael is a freshman in the College of Arts and Sciences, and they'll be reading some poetry, I think. I'll turn it over to you, Raphael. Um, yeah, this is a poem called Love in a Time of Global Warming. Dear heart, the pond is in bloom again. The water was shimmering beneath the bellies of a family of swans. They glided past me and sent me wary looks down pointed beaks. I gave them a wide berth in the canoe. Their cygnets nestled fuzzy beaks into their wings, necks arching back in gray beams. Sunlight slanted down onto the sand in the shallows, and blue crabs moved against the ground in a bishop's diagonal stride. At tense war with the lake and the clumps of green algae and the bits of driftwood and their own clambering bodies, their claws raised and desperate. I sat on the broken wicker seat and thought that I was getting better and how perfect all this was. Because you see, the pond is getting better too, darling. The minnows are back to throw their silvery slipper frames into the air. 
It was like I could hear the flowers snapping open and the leaves grinning in girlish rhapsody. Gone was the brown sludge that had once shoved its way onto the shore in grim lethargy. Gone was the still pond with its glassy waters. It was brimming with energy, and don't you see, I gave it away. I gave away all that I had too much of, and that nervous vibration looks much better on the ospreys circling above. Their eyes pierced my chest like golden spears, delicate and gleaming. It will fall out of bloom soon, but in unpredictable ways, which I find I am okay with, and I am not sure if it is a sign of getting better or of some new madness. Perhaps the ospreys will remain years from now, punched like vultures on bare branches. Or maybe they will go first, to where I will not know, but I know I will be here to watch. These eddies kick themselves up in the smooth flow, and what a dream to get lost in their currents. XX, right back soon. All right, wonderful, thank you. Um, I think now we're turning it over to Rob. So Rob, feel free to take it away. Great, thanks so much, uh, Rachel. And, and thanks, Alex, for sharing your students' work. Um, I uh, have six students reading tonight, so I wanna get right into their work. I'll uh, introduce them each with something I admire so much about their writing, and then I'll read a short poem at the end. Uh, so our first writer tonight from my class is Adam Spiegelman. From the very first assignment this semester, Adam seized us with his distinctive voice and wit. It's tempting to describe Adam's writing as raw, given how uh, honest and urgent it is, and it, its ex exploration of compulsion and emotional conflict head on. Um, and it never spares us any grit along the way. But to describe it as raw would be misleading, um, since it's always so careful, carefully choreographed and well-crafted. It really speaks for itself, so I want to turn it over to Adam. Wow, that was so sweet, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a poem called Phoenix Avenue. I live on the top floor of a dumbass house. Looks like the one on the American football album cover, you know the one. Sometimes I have guys over that act like I live in the hood. I get it, I guess. I bring a knife to hook up sometimes too. God, I wish I had the chance to use it. Across the street, the mommy starts screaming. She hits her kids a lot, I think. Definitely yanks their arms a bunch and yells at her fat fucking whore of a daughter. She missed the school bus again and lost, lost the bench scraper, I think. Honestly, she has a point. The girl is not very good at raking. Tonight, I'm waiting for some guy again. I'm the real fat fucking whore sitting on this pizza box that's been rained on and trampled so long, it's basically decoupage to the pavement. I can't believe it. It took me so long to realize I didn't have to live this way. And then I went and did it anyways. Who asked you? Wish you were here to smell the guy coming over that looks like a Legend of Zelda boss. You know the one. Dungeon dwelling crank bean trucker. Sweet aroma of ripe lacrosse cleats. And of course his name is also Nick. In a dream I laughed at the sound of my own wedding. And the vows were, you've made your bed, now go make mine. You shit, you only bear to be beautiful and apologize for it in advance like a first child. In the hospital, I begged my mom to just fucking give up, you bitch, you fat fucking whore. I said, there is nothing under my thirst but more thirst, all of it against medical advice. Nick 2.0 pulls up a blubbering, nodding mess, big boner killer in a Honda Civic with a spoiler. Damn kid, was it good for you too? What's the question again? What is it exactly you were so addicted to? Living in the stupefied silence of boulder miracles, you know the one, or the very, very long walk you've been taking through the park ever since you decided you weren't him anymore. The sign says it closes after dark, but there's no one around to ask who could possibly know. That's it. Thanks, Adam. So our next reader is Faisal Al-Assad. Faisal's commitment to poetry as a sonic art is infectious. His work this semester has explored longing, desperation, and the ways we run from trauma, but always through the medium of words as sound. It's uh, delightful to hear Faisal's uh, writing out loud in the way that it's meant to be, so I'm excited to turn it over to Faisal. Hi, thanks, Rob. Um, I 
I wrote a poem called Permatrip. Uh, just for those of you who might not know, Permatrip is the state of being like in a permanent, like it's permanent state of tripping from doing too much like shrooms or LSD, whatever you're into. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna go into it. <laughs> okay. Lysergic dripping down my open mouth, my eyes fixated, dead and spiraled, breath warm and saliva sativic, Still and dizzied like a heat stroke, but there is no sun, just hot liquid medicine. I'm in a permatrip and I can't get out. I'm in a permatrip and each time I try to escape, my thoughts permutate. Your eyes, French windows, I'm in them, knocking and shouting, sinking and spiraling. I can't help but tell you that I'm hypnotized by your presence. Paul, when I'm with you and you're on my tongue, I feel a serenation of serotonin. I feel the air out of itself, my body an inch next to me. Paul, two tropics, orange and yellow, both hot gave me sunburns, none of which own the concept of duality. Am I still functioning? My wires are distraught, delicate, dark red bomb cords and I strum them in pairs. Parties where I'm birthed in citrus skies and fed rusted repairs. I couldn't raise you up even if I wanted to. The memory of your existence tasered me, leaving every bone in my body to let out a cry that reverberated till 2020, where even now things have failed to get better. I remember how rightful I tried to play off my falls, that I was the victim of an exorcism gone wrong, that somehow my hometown only succeeded to remove the good in me, leaving behind the whites in my eyes. This talking, breathing, smiling corpse backed out with his ears against the walls, trying to learn as much about a life he has no right to be a part of. Permatrip dripped down and dotted my open mouth, my eyes fixated, dead and hypnotic. I haven't seen you in years, yet in my mind, you still run and drain me. I only had you once before, and today I'm obsessed. 13 hours of sleep to dream about us sets me up for another 11 of unrest. I'm here to show you I can forever be yours. What time is the test? Can't promise to be the strongest, the prettiest, surely not the best, but darker times come and I'll janitor your mess. My sweet friend, my glowing palm tree, against you, I think I'm at a loss of energy to fight. Soothe me, volume to my sight, but when you're in my system, I'm hurt and it leaks volatile. Yeah, that's that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Faisal. So our next uh, writer tonight is uh, Katie Ford. Katie Ford is a writer from Florida. Her work this semester has demonstrated a remarkable ability to link telling detail after telling detail and then harvest the subtext to create interior experiences without having to spell them out for the reader. She accomplishes so much in such short spaces, so I'm really excited for you to hear Katie read tonight. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, my poem tonight is super, super short, but it's called An Evening with Eric. So uh, here we go. I hadn't seen him since Valentine's Day. He apologized for calling me a cunt, but not for calling me stupid. He said we would go for drinks. He was an hour late. We never even left my apartment. He ordered a $40 pizza off my phone. He just bought himself a $25,000 watch. I have $300 to my name, now 260. We fucked, he left. I went to sleep alone. He said he'd text me tomorrow. He didn't. Thank you. Thank you. So our next reader tonight will be Michael Gomez. Michael is a writer from California. His passion for the craft of writing is evident in his work and in his enthusiasm for class. His poems and stories explore people at emotional crossroads and through their specific conflicts, he brings us to his universal themes. Here's Michael. Hey y'all. Um, so I will be reading uh, a microfiction called uh, Solitude. And it starts uh, with a quote. Um, there is a fellowship more quiet even than solitude and which rightly understood is solitude made perfect. Uh, that's Robert Louis Stevenson. Her eyes held the reflection of embers in our campfire, like tiny boats on a dark blue sea. It reminded me of when I went to the beach with my parents and a fire had engulfed a nearby storefront. I sat for a moment and watched the light shimmer along the water. And I couldn't help but find it sort of cruel that the ocean didn't somehow help to quell the flames. I watched her eyes focus on our fire pit and I felt it as though she was quietly asking it to die. 
It did, slowly. Despite the best efforts of the wood, I'd cut my leg gathering just before the sun fell. Night crept in closer, finding that light had given way to the darkness of the forest around us. For a while, she didn't speak. Neither did I. It's not that there wasn't anything to say, but rather that there was too much weight to any words we might be able to scrape together. Her eyes shifted from the fire to my now bandaged wound. Does it hurt, she asked me. Not really, I said. I'm trying not to think about it. We sat with our legs crisscrossed, like when we were children. Somehow, despite being an objectively uncomfortable way to sit, it felt safe. That moment felt safe, and I'd realized I'd always felt safe with her. She let me rest my head on her shoulder, the two of us grateful for the trees that shielded our little clearing from the outside world. It felt just out of reach from airports and responsibilities and studies, and it felt like, for just a moment, I owned that little piece of time. I've never brought anyone up here, she tells me. It's my little secret. I'm honored. I'm not good at goodbyes. She closed her eyes for just a little longer than a standard blink, denying a tear of its own existence. Neither am I, but those are for tomorrow. We sat in silence for the rest of the night. I don't remember if we slept, but if we did, it was in each other's arms. I wanted to stay there with her forever, but as I watched the last embers of our campfire fade away, I knew I'd have to eventually let her go. It was then that I felt three unspoken words beg to be heard, but they didn't need to be. We knew. Thanks, Michael. So our next uh, reader tonight is Sean Coles. Sean Cole's writing this semester has been beautifully spare and ethereal with great attention to nature and the American Southwest. He writes with conviction toward the mystic and the eternal. So uh, let's hear Sean's story for the night. Thanks, Rob. Um, this is called Between Worlds. Lying before me, a cigarette butt between two leaves. Around me, trees stand still and stiff, soldiers against a cloudy sky. Come closer, she whispers. With gravity, I step towards her. Around the cigarette, not on it, I tell myself. The red swoosh on my Nike Cortez is fading. I notice the vague colors, the frayed threads. The pine needles around us, when alive and together and spread across the branches of a tree, look soft and inviting in the fading afternoon light. Sharpness arises in my chest, and I step again towards her. Closer, she laughs. Leaves crunch beneath me, and now I'm in her arms. We're swaying like trees in the wind, except there is no wind and I feel no attachment to the ground below me. I'm in her arms swaying and I close my eyes and imagine that we're on a ship bound for Europe and the rhythm that we are moving to is that of the sea. I don't think that there's anything that can change her mind, I think to myself while staring at the sticks that litter the forest floor. With less light, the clouds like fingerprint marks on a giant TV screen, pasty and wet. I hear you, I finally say, I hear you. Not now, but later she would tell me that she loved me. I, don't, I didn't believe you then, I would tell her in response, and I don't now. In her, arms, in her arms, though, I feel more free than I've felt in my entire life. I try to remember other times, maybe on the Chesapeake Bay in October, I say out loud. The leaves were falling and it was the east, so it was, be it was beautiful and commemorated and important. The air like anxiety, teeming. Against that tree, I finally tell her as I point to a wrinkled oak trunk. Let's sit down for once. The sky suddenly darker and the clouds gone. I reach down and to feel for the ground. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Our final reader for my class will be Monica Barrett. Monica is a poet and a fiction writer from Nevada. Her poetry and short fiction seems to emerge uh, feeling fully formed, always with a clear sense of voice which she switches comfortably between a conversational and intense mode uh, between different pieces. She's always careful to keep earning the emotional stakes of her work. And um, so I'll turn it over to Monica so you can hear what I mean. Hi, uh, I have no idea what to read. So I'm just gonna open up Safari and whatever is open, I'm gonna read. <laughs> okay, it's a poem about Nevada, so. I was 500 miles out of Nevada when I realized I knew almost nothing. This was long after you had pointed out the sagebrush to me, said it was the most beautiful thing you'd ever seen, told me that the Native Americans from the area performed healing rituals with it, that I needed to smell it in the rain. This was also after I got scolded for calling sagebrush a weed in Ms. Thompson's fourth grade class. The assignment had been fun facts about Nevada. Nevada. Capital, Carson City, Bird, Mountain Blue Jay, 
flower sagebrush. Here's a fun fact about Nevada. It is emptiness. It is vast stretches of desert and tumbleweed and long roads you can drive along for hours without ever seeing another human being. Nevada, home to America's loneliest road. My mother calls it the road to nowhere. Are those the same thing, being lonely and having nowhere to go? She must have thought I was crazy, the way I ran out of the house as soon as I heard thunder. I needed to smell it, to fill up my lungs with the sweetness and the wetness and the earthiness. I ran all the way to the highway where I knew there would be sagebrush. I was reading Renata Adler, but I threw her on the tile floor. I was rushing, I was impatient. I cannot tell you why, only that I needed more than anything to smell the sagebrush. And you were right. The rain kept pouring down on me and my vans were getting wrecked, but I didn't care because everything was clouded by the scent of that wet sagebrush, the smell of cool mountain air and the buzz of cicadas and wet stucco and the morning mist on blades of grass. The smell of Nevada, the ugliest land in the world, the loneliest land in the world. Then the sagebrush, a silvery mirage of velvet leaves and smoky blue stalks. Mark Twain said sagebrush country was a forest and exquisite miniature. Maybe the loneliest land in the world is just a reflection of its surveyor, but I'm not sure. There are so many things I don't know. Like I'm wandering until I can find a moonlit path made of desert and tumbleweed and sagebrush that will lead me somewhere that feels like home. That's it. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna read one uh, piece and then I'll turn it over to the, the next instructor. Um, so this is a poem called On Account of Getting His Leg Broke by New York City. On account of getting his leg broke by New York City cops, they gave my friend Carl a city year in Rikers. Some call it a bullet. The DA called it a sweetheart deal to keep him away from all those white supremacists upstate. But at his sentencing, bailiffs made us leave early when we started hugging, told us this is not a wedding, as if we got lost on the way to Our Lady of Perpetual Ignominy. ignominy. Uh, mistook the 26 cops in the courtroom for a choir, all of them staring down the metal detected crowd. It took six hours to visit Rikers Island for an hour with Carl. In the last of five waiting rooms, they had pictures of the Carnegie Hall and jail program. I asked Carl about it. He thought it was a funny joke. This is how I learned even governments say we used to, to tell stories about what they did just the once. Then Carl asked me to send more letters. He puts them under his flimsy mattress for extra padding. Time was up. We got one hug. No one mistook it for a wedding. I got back to my phone after all that to 27 angry emails asking where I was. I replied to them, fuck you, one by one, with the kind of deliberation Carl told me he's been practicing. No, I didn't say fuck you. I said, I'm sorry I was out of pocket. It won't happen again. It should have, but it didn't. I wanna be that kind of friend who sends letters. I just write them and feel bad about feeling bad. Carl, just for you, I bought some really soft paper. Thank you. Wow, thank you all so much. Um, all right, I think now I'll turn it over to Eva from Hannah's class. Hi, um, so I didn't realize that Hannah's class or like that each class had a specific time. So I'm here now. Um, I'm also at work, so if you hear some ruckus in the back, don't mind it, um, but I just wanted to make sure I made it. Um, so I'm going to read a piece called Golden Brown. Um, there is a trigger warning of sexual assault, so if that means you need to mute me, do what you need to do. Okay. Um, it's the afternoon of March 4th, a Wednesday. I am being sent home from the traveling gap year program I was a part of since October 2019. I am at the Tel Aviv airport, but I can't remember how I got here. I am all alone at my gate, sitting by a wall, hoping not to see him. I board my flight, shaking with anxiety, constrained, with the, constrained by the thoughts of everything that happened this week. 15 hours later, I am home in Los Angeles. My family greets me with only love, but I don't feel any more at ease. I actually begin to feel worse. I miss my girlfriends and the support and affection that only they can provide. I miss my green corduroy overalls I thrifted from the cutest little shop in Japan earlier, in the, earlier that year, as I took home only a small por portion of my belongings, thinking I would return shortly. I am broken, frightened by a friendly man who compliments me on my mini skirt at a Starbucks in West Hollywood. My complexion, normally flushed, rosy, and a deep tone of olive is drained of its warmth. And still, I'm confused over how I got to the airport. 
It's like I was a pancake, just poured into a sizzling pan, bubbling and thriving, then flipped too early and kept on the stove until burnt and inedible. What's a pancake to do then? You can try to scrape off the charred pieces, but it won't taste as good as a freshly made one would. It's nighttime on March 19th, a Thursday, and I'm driving to see Yaakov, my now boyfriend. This was our text message. This was our text messages from that night. Give or take a few commas I added here and there. Yaakov, wait, don't come yet. Eric Garcetti is speaking. He's about to announce new restrictions in LA. He's the mayor. Me, I know, LOL. I mean, the restrictions probably aren't going to start right, right here, right now. Yaakov, I don't know, something about the way he's talking. Like today's the day things will change for the city. Me, shit, I mean, I'm already driving. Yaakov, okay, you can come, but when he announces the new restrictions, I may not come out. Me, dude, just come, to say, just come say hi to me, I'm driving to you. Yaakov, stay at home order goes, in, goes into effect at midnight. Me, whoa, we have until midnight then. I brought you a banana, how can you resist? Lo and behold, Yaakov could not resist the offer. So we had until midnight. We spent the few, those few hours driving together through the Hollywood Hills and pausing at a viewpoint of the whole city. I been loozled him with the what are we question and did not get the answer I wanted. And so my lockdown started with an unfortunate dose of friend zone. It's Saturday, the, oh, don't mind that. It's Saturday the 30th of May and Yaakov and I are officially dating. What changed? He finally caved into my irresistible good looks and mind-blowing charisma. At least that's how I tell it. At this point, the tremor I developed during quarantine from bouts of PTSD and entanglements with anxiety has calmed. I'm not as weary around strangers as I was two months prior. I no longer sleep in until 6 p.m., then emotionally abuse myself over wasting a day. My eating disorder has settled, and for the first time in a while, I am comfortable around food. I apply for a job at Sweet Green at Chendi a trendy salad chain and begin working in July. Now, my worries have shifted from insatiable frustration and anger towards my gap year program to how fluffy the kale looks today and if we have more hot sauce in the back. Now I earn nearly $400 a week, whereas before I lost hundreds of, hundreds of hours deteriorating. Now I voluntarily sleep in the same bed as a boy and consens consensually kiss his cheek as he kisses my hand in the front seat of, the white, of my white Honda Civic. Now, when I have a panic attack, I am not alone. In place of assault, there is comfort, comfort. In place of excommunication, there is inclusion. In place of not being fit for a program abroad due to mental illness, there is my psychiatrist, psychiatrist Wendy encouraged me to talk about my eating disorder and, and understand that it does not make me crazy. In place of rape centers, there are sunsets on the beaches of Santa Barbara, the freedom to go where I want and when I want. In, in place of blame, disbelief, there is strength and there is trust. In place of suicide prevention hotlines, there are kale salads and fulfilling online orders. Above all, there is Yaakov. As I sit here now writing this essay, I'm in, I am in tears. I'm sitting at the desk in my bedroom, surrounded by art supplies and framed charcoal portraits I have drawn. My twinkly lights tw tacked on, onto my wall in the shape of a heart glow behind me. My cocoa butter chapstick waiting to be applied sits beside my computer. My new black online moleskin journal rests to, the, rests to the right of me, open to the page of my brainstorms for this piece. Quote, sequence, assault, coming home, COVID, Yaakov, no, better. Coming home, Yaakov, assault, me writing this. So here I am writing this. I have practiced so many times sharing this story, drafting Facebook posts, meeting with lawyers, speaking with Wendy. Throughout each of those trial runs, I never, expect, I never expected my college creative writing class to be the place I feel safest sharing. I could have indulged in the details, but I didn't. I wanted to say just enough. So how does one end the piece like this with heartbreak and falling in love all in one? Well, I can say now that my pancakes are golden brown and only sometimes well done. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Eva. I'm so glad you were able to jump in. Um, all right, and last, last group, at least I'll turn it over to Sasha. <laughs> thanks, Rachel, and thanks everyone who read before us. I am so excited for my students to read and for all of you to get to hear them. I think I'll follow in Rob's lead and introduce my students one by one and then read at the end. So first up, we have Hannah Lipsky. Hannah is a poet of the senses. Her works are rich with vivid detail and imagery that is 
sometimes cinematic, sometimes nostalgic, and always lingers with whoever gets to hear it. Hannah, I'm turning it over to you. Great, right. thank you so much. Um, so I'll be reading a poem called Summer Festival. Warm street lamps and cheerful streamers draped between the scales covering roofs of aged buildings. The moonlight caresses frost, frosted glass windows over a path full of tales told from generation to generation. Drunken laughter, salty steaming karage, and children in kimonos cradling sweets. Her wrinkled, lightly spotted soft hand resting in the crook of a child's elbow, who's unable to speak nor comprehend her half-native native tongue, both wanting desperately to know, how's your day? Where did you grow up? What's your favorite subject? Were things different then? Do you like school? How old were you during the war? I wish you could understand. I wish you could understand. Instead, they walk arm and elbow through a street of stories, shimmering windows, and wooden homes under flapping streamers and glowing lanterns. Thank you, Hannah. Oh, it's so good to hear that poem. Um, our next reader is Rose. Rose Hernandez writes from a place of deep tenderness. Her poems illuminate the daily and the mundane with a caring and transformative attention. I'm so looking forward to hearing them. Rose, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, you guys were all amazing. This is a lot. <laughs> Um, so this is called Getting It Done. Getting it done is not the way I want to be doing things. When I fold my t-shirts, I try to think of how soft they are. And when I write my essays, I try to think I'd like to think of this anyway. And when I call her, I try to not look at the clock. And so if my chest is tight, I think I'm only holding myself. And I'll force the air into my lungs through a hole under my chin. I'm so scared living will become work again, but sometimes it's work to see it as anything else. Thank you so much for reading that, Rose. That was so good to hear. Um, our next and final reader from my class is John Ellis. John Ellis is a wordsmith. He crafts memorable characters, compelling narratives, and syntactically fresh, wryly funny prose. John, I'm gonna turn it over to you so everyone can hear what I'm talking about. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, just Quick heads up, uh, the sky seem to have opened up here in Staten Island. So if you hear uh, the elements over my voice, hopefully I'll, I'll try to speak over those and hopefully the flickering of lights won't be too distracting. Uh, so I'm going to be reading um, a poetry piece entitled The Pumpkin Patch. Uh, there are gonna be a few voices uh, at play in this. I'll be uh, invoking those as we proceed. So hope you enjoy. <clears throat> Would that my eyes emerge from non-existence and meet those of the lot before me. Brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, black, old and young, naked, bespectacled, eyes united in vibrance, they glow at the sight of me. Their gazes are akin to those of Princess Charming, and indeed I am the belle of their ball, though I've replaced my, ma my glass slipper with a magic stem. I wish they could see beyond my ribs and skin and find the graciousness within my eyes, a graciousness they need not paint upon me, with eyes born from imagination. I want to reciprocate the feelings. I want to let these eyes know that I want to be theirs, nay, them to be mine, as much as they, me, theirs. And then I want to ask them a question. Why, pray tell, can't this status of feeling special last for longer than two months out of the year? Is there enough grass in this spot to obscure me? Should I pray to the winds? Should I futilely strain my seeds? to roll to more clandestine grounds, anything, anything at all, to keep from being seen, to stifle their temptations to take me. This is where I am rooted. This is my home. Please nature, please God, don't let them evict me. Many of us, when we are plucked, will settle into new roles of autumnal ornaments. We will become the decor of our masters and proud symbols of their celebration. But some of us, the especially rotund, have a different fate ahead of us. This sex shall aid in holiday observance of the edible form. Our endearing plumpness shall be transmogrified by the hungry mouths and hearts of our consumers. A pie, a bread, a muffin, a latte, a soup, a cake, pancakes. There is no shortage of ends. To many, this future is unnerving. The trek from farm to fork feels frankly frightful, I understand. 
But may I posit to you, my brethren, which is superior, being kept idle at our master's stoops, reduced to an observation, a mention by a guest, resigned to arm's length bond until the season ends, at which point our purpose fades and we are ejected without thought, or the alternative, an invitation inside the home where our masters and their guests do more than point us out. They take us in, they craft us, they play with us, and our importance is affirmed not by the minimum of presence, but by integration. For indeed, our masters did not make us a part of the home. They made us a part of them. I forgive you. I know you wanted me. I know I was your first choice. After those starting steps, believe it or not, you were my first choice too. Today my pulp pulsates with pride. My seeds like butterflies inside, a flutter in this orange bride, to make my namesake coincide with slang endearing to it tied. Three vexing seasons I did bide, through which my fervor multiplied. I ached for when kids far and wide would come for new friends pre-Yuletide. And as the farms invitees stride to view their options and decide, at risk of sounding deified, this perfect gourd can't be denied. For this occasion, I confide, I vow to not be left aside. I've grown in manners dignified to be desirable. I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried. These viewers won't let defects slide. Thus, I must keep a pristine hide so I can find someone's good side. I have to know. Tell me, father and son, once I am yours, what will you do? I'm open to anything. You can paint a face onto me, a logo, a scene, a family crest. I'll wear it with honor. Or make a jack-o'-lantern out of me. I'll scream, I'll squeal, I'll roar, I'll yell with glee. Or you can just keep me nice and bare if you like me just the way I am. I have no preferences. However, I do have one request. Whatever you elect to do with me, I beg you, please make it a memory. Because more than either one of you bonding with me, I want to be your vehicle for bonding with each other. All of my friends are on their way to brand new places. And all I can do here is wonder what it was they had that I didn't, or rather, perhaps, what I had that they didn't. My piece, thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much to my incredible students. And thank you everyone else who's read. Um, my poem that I'm going to share with you guys tonight is titled, for now titled, Sun Forest. It took me years to wonder where my father hid the cell phones he called us from in prison. International calls, so costly. I know about the lice, his cellmates. I know about his broken arms, but not his pain. I learned about his crimes from articles in the Russian news. Yes, I Googled him. Yes, my father, his court proceedings, his supposed crimes. I measured the story in print against his words, yes. Yes, my father is a liar, and for years I tried to stop loving him, but I have not. In those years, I've come to believe there should be no prisons. My father, the former prisoner, would disagree. When I visit Russia for the first time since leaving, as a child who just learned to roll her R's, he's been transferred to a nearby prison, but refuses to let me see him. I go seven years without seeing him. Last winter, driving at 3 a.m. to Finland Station, we pass one of his former prisons. It's old and empty. It was built by Ivan the Terrible. It was until they shut it down years after my father left it, Europe's oldest prison. Look at those windows, those cells, prime real estate, riverfront views. We talk when he calls, I say, Maybe now is a good time to quit smoking. And he says, now is the worst time to quit smoking. I've never been more stressed. The first years he was in prison, no one told me. Last winter, I booked the train from St. Petersburg to Helsinki to see the Finnish landscape in winter. 
but the sun didn't come up for hours. There were furs outside the window, I know, but I couldn't see them. Thank you guys. Oh, wow, thank you all so, so much. Um, it, I can't think of a better way to spend the last hour than, than listening to all that incredible work. Um, that wraps it up for this evening. Maybe we could give one more round of applause to everyone who read. Um, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, that was really so so special and such a great a great hour. <laughs> um, so yeah, this this meeting is being recorded, so the recording should be up uh, on our website shortly, and we'll, I'll make sure to send that link out to all instructors so everyone can get it. Um, thank you so much again, and uh, stay safe, everyone. Have a great evening. Take care.